Welcome. How how was your how was your extended weekend? Any highlights? Washed your car. Okay. Do you wash your car um, frequently? No. Okay. All right. You know, I think they they try to recommend since we live in a colder climate that. Uh, with, with salt and all that other stuff they put on the road, if you can clean your car once a month, you know, that'd be fantastic. But, you know, there could be some restrictions and all that stuff, <clears throat> especially if you, you don't want to clean your car when, you know, it's going to be negative temperatures. So then it'd be hard to get into the car because the doors might freeze. Details. All right. Anyone else with highlights? Won't see too many burns. So hopefully we got outside. We got. Say that again. You went to Afton Park. All right. Nice, nice, nice walking. All right. Good. All right. I try to spend as much time as possible outside. Even you know, so warm out, you know, break out the shorts as well. All that. So again, hopefully you had a good weekend, whatever you did. All right. Um, so we are almost done with uh, this case study. Well, today is the last day for you to put your case study together here. Before we get to it, you know, every day I try to talk about something. And here um, I have a good uh, democracy. Since we are focusing on authoritarian regimes, I thought if I could find uh, any indicators out there uh, about democracy, and this is put out by the uh, Economist uh, Media Organization. So this is not connected with any government or uh, any international organization like the United Nations. It's put out by the Economist um, News Agency, so it's media. And so it's important to kind of have that context uh, when you are looking at this. You know, if we did an OPVL, uh, The Economist is a international um, news agency. They want to focus on international uh, topics and they tend to be moderate to perhaps uh, left leaning. So uh, it does have that media bias with it. But still, it's been doing this since uh, the 1930s, about 34, 35. They've been around and they've been looking at um, democracy index. And in many ways, like the name of the magazine itself or news agency is The Economist. And so they are looking more for, you know, those economic indicators. And part of that is... Um, political indicators as well. Politics and stability, we know, can have an impact on economic uh, development here. So with that, 2020 latest, uh, and they looked at 167 countries, and those here in the room, Mexico does exist, all right? It's just that um, it's a light blue, so it's in the flawed democracy like the United States in a, in a flawed democracy, but um, the lighter the, the blue, it's harder to see. So like some of these countries out here might be missing. Well, that's because they're a little bit lighter blue for those that are here. So, you know, for me, naturally, I'm like, I want to know what do they consider uh, their criteria when we determine a country is a full democracy and a country that's an authoritarian regime. They claim that there are 57 out of 167 countries they looked at, 57 of them fit the authoritarian regime category. And they say that there's only 23 countries that have full democracies, meaning that there's nothing that's really impeding them. And 52 that kind of have flawed democracies in the United States has fallen into that. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. But they looked at things like um, the electoral process and 
you know, access to the electoral process, or electoral process, excuse me, uh, the functioning of the government and the political participation. How much political participation do people really, really have? And they also looked at uh, democratic um, political culture. What kind of culture, history do they have dealing with uh, democracy or Republican um, systems and civil liberties? How, how much civil liberties do people really, really have? So they looked at those things, all right? And before I break it down and look at, you know, the United States, what kind of conclusions can you draw from just this map? When you look at democracy index in 2020, all right, either here or at home, what kind of conclusions can you draw? Old world seems to be Okay, so you're saying old world, new world. All right. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Oh. Okay. So, and w I think we'll, we'll I think we'll find out maybe there's some reasons why that that plays a part why we think that the countries that we tend to be more powerful uh, tend to be more democratic. Or if we look at, you know, more powerful, what do we mean by that? Are we talking about um, throwing words like more developed, perhaps when you look at some of the systems that are in place in these countries, uh, that could, that could indicate a uh, play a role there as well. All right. Anything else? What about that game you played in 10th grade? Scramble for Africa. Okay. That was about imperialism, wasn't it? And you look, here is the region. All right. This could be an impact of imperialism as well. Um, and uh, in terms of whether or not systems were able to develop during colonial rule during colonial times and then uh, be developed after. Many of these countries gained their independence after World War II. And so in the 1950s and 60s, you're seeing uh, either a peaceful transition from uh, being governed by Great Britain, France, Portugal, Spain, whoever it might have been, to now more home rule or it could have spiraled into something pretty nasty. Also, um, their experiences with the West and, and industrialized countries may not have been uh, positive, and so they tended to go maybe in a more uh, authoritarian, left-leaning, um, non-democratic route. And slowly are they transitioning perhaps into the, in the 21st century, we're starting to see some slow transitions, right? And so the question is, you know, how long does it take? Where here, some of these countries, remember, they, they gained their independence in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century, you know, like the United States, we gained our independence in the 18th century. The, these countries are gaining them in the 19th century but they tended to have more local control. Sometimes we even refer to salutary neglect where um, England just left the colonists up to their own to really kind of govern themselves. They were more interested in the economic pieces, but left the, the local control. And so uh, when the United States gained its independence, we already had this experience, perhaps, with, with democracy. Uh, 
Mexico or any of the South American countries, they already have some in place. But we notice that many of them are flawed, flawed democracy. So what the heck does that mean? Flawed democracy. So in the case of the United States, we look at today, 2020, 2021, um, what can we say about our politics in the United States? What can we say? What kind of conclusions that we have seen in this past year? Okay, right or the left, either on the right or the left side. All right, and um, okay. All right, anyone else? No other thoughts. And if you're at home, oh, indicate bias. This colors could have indicated bias, perhaps. Lobbying can be problematic, all right? Lobbying can lead to identity politics. Lobbying could influence um, outcome of bills or stop. Oh, yeah, outcome of bills, whether or not they become laws or not. All right, good. Anyone else? So if we look at the United States, um, you brought up left or right. Political cohesion uh, is, is, uh, has deteriorated in the United States, right? And the Economist magazine will highlight that as well, that there seems to be an evaporation of cohesion. Um, both the, hey, what do you got? Oh. Um, I think, you know, Democrats and Republicans, they could differ um, politically, have fierce dialogue, but then probably go out and have dinner together. That might not necessarily be the case today, where Democrats and Republicans can have fierce dialogue with each other. They probably aren't going to go to McDonald's together and have a Big Mac. Instead, they're probably going to go to separate news agencies and start ripping on each other, perhaps. Maybe. Okay, uh, political participation. Has political participation in the United States increased? Yes, it has. However, there's been question marks. Why is there question marks? What have we been saying about our elections the past election cycles? About voter participation. Whether we agree or disagree with it. What, what is some of the political rhetoric out there about our, the voter participation in our elections? What's that? Well, you have to vote regardless. How accurate is the voting? You know, people who are voting, and again, it, it depends on who you listen to and all that. You know, there, there's a question about, about the authenticity of voter participation. Maybe some of the votes are fraud, fraudulent. May not, or may be, all right? All those things out there. So we do have participation increase, but there has been some question marks there, which then also leads to another thing that the economists and others have brought up about trust. Trust in the system, okay? And so there's been some question marks about that. Has the American public lost trust in the political system. So you have all those things there and freedom of expression. We do like to express our opinion, don't we? But um, one would say increasingly over the past um, four years, there seems to be some erosion of freedom of expression over uh, maybe restriction to certain types of media platforms or just simply assemble and, and they're taken to another level. 
So that is what puts the United States in the flawed category. Now, it doesn't mean that the United States is um, going to be going further down. Just that's what the this agency is saying right now. There's perhaps measures. So out of 167 countries, 67 countries, they rank the United States number 25. Number 25. So they're just outside the full democracy um, category. Canada, well, they make it. The United States is not me. Oh, well. John F. Kennedy, when he was standing at the Berlin Wall, said democracy is not perfect. So um, our experiment isn't perfect, but maybe perhaps one that we can work towards perfecting all that. So what is the worst country, according to The Economist, is no real big surprise. It's this country right here on a peninsula. It was North Korea. All right. On a scale of 0 to 10, they came in just a little over 1. All right. So according to The Economist, all that stuff, there's a lot of restrictions. The best, the best country according to them, is hanging out right here in Norway, led by uh, a person with the nickname Iron Erna. Iron Erna. So she's considered to be kind of like Mar a Margaret Thatcher, who was called the Iron Lady. It's er Erna Solberg. She has been the conservative prime minister of Norway since 2013. Norway does have uh, a very um, vibrant multi-party political system. They like to differ, but they do seem to have political cohesion. So that's, that's a big piece there. But you can see that the Scandinavian countries seem to get along, or it seem to be up there, as well as Canada up there. Um, the United States, like I said, we came in number 25. 25. So... We're, the, we're, we're close. We're close. 23 nations are full democracy. So we're close. And so we had been up in the full democracy category uh, all the way up to 2016. So that could also speak maybe a little bit to the media bias as well in there. Because in 2016, who was elected president of the United States? And how is his relationship with the media? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. Pretty tough. There's, there's no sugarcoating that one. All right, pretty tough. And he's not the only president that's had difficult relationships with the press. All right. So um, he's our most contemporary one. So we're gonna we're gonna spotlight. We can find a number of them in the 20th century, 19th century that didn't that did not like even George Washington had troubles with the press. So, and we consider him all that in a bag of chips, George Washington. All right. So there we go. Uh, any, any final thoughts on that? Kind of dragged on it a little bit here, but I always feel like, you know, I want to get a little bit of political science in here as well. And since that we are dealing with authoritarians, this be appropriate as well. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, give you now the rest of the class period to work on completing this authoritarian case study. When you get it done, please submit that or share it with me. But it, today is the, the last day that we'll work on it, so it is due, and tomorrow we'll move on and we'll take on the commies in the Cold War. Okay, we'll be shifting to a new one. So with that, um, let's work on it here. Those at home, you can stay on, ask questions or exit. Have a great day. Uh, and work on it and have success.